Well, I have no predictions for this election. I mean, of course, we have the surveys to go by, but my specialty is more in the qualitative kind of research. And one of the main things that I did in this election, together with a colleague, Patricia Evangelista, is to map the narratives of the five presidential candidates this election. You talked about the imagined president with Patricia. Let's give a summary, especially now in light of the fact that time has elapsed and right. passed since then. Where do you see the narrative having the closest in terms of the, the voters' response for their you know, prescribed narrative or the, the image that they were trying to produce. Right. When we were starting the campaign season, we think that the two candidates who were topping the polls, Vice President Binay and Senator Poe, are the two candidates that have very clear narratives. So Vice President Binay, for example, has the narrative of, I was born poor, I know poverty, I can solve poverty, look at Makati. Grace Poe has a narrative of compassion, drawing from her, her roots as a foundling. These found resonance and, in a sense, people can relate to these narratives. Our interpretation interpretation here is that these narratives were resonant to a point until Rodrigo Duterte entered the picture because his narrative is an interesting narrative not just of being of fear mongering or being demagogic about it but by talking about the importance of urgency of resolving problems here and now and this is very distinct because a lot of the candidates are talking about platforms, long-term plans. And you have this candidate who talks about resolving issues in three to six months. I think that's very relevant at a time when the government is trumpeting all of its successes with K-12, with conditional cash transfer. And these are policies that have long-term effects. And sometimes it obscures the more immediate issues of crises, of the everyday issues of peace and order. That's why the Duterte narrative emerged. That's the interpretation I have. So in, in a way, he kind of securitized the issues and made them more immediate and I guess palatable also for, a, for a, you know, an electorate that was very hungry for these immediate results. But let's talk about the discourse itself because that was right. beyond the candidate's control already. Right. You look at social media taking over in terms of the kind of uh, debates and issues and meanings assigned to their narratives. What, what was it about the Duterte narrative, I think, apart from immediate, the immediacy of it, that really made it all very viral until this day with now a 12-13 point lead. Right. I think what's very interesting about the Duterte discourse is that a lot of people can take part in shaping that narrative. For example, someone from Mindanao can appropriate his narrative as someone who can give voice to the South. So they can look over the, let's say, the sexist, the misogynist remarks because he has a redeeming quality of coming from the South. People from NCR, and let's not forget that before Duterte became the frontrunner across all regions, across all socioeconomic class, he was first strong in NCR, class A, B, and C. And they can appropriate the narrative of Duterte, as you mentioned, through security and peace and order. So I think that is the strength of the Duterte narrative. Unlike Binay that just boxed it into an issue of poverty, unlike Grace Poe that boxed the issue into compassion, Duterte's narrative can be appropriated in many different ways. That's why it's effective. Well, this is also a good jump of point, to call to the vice presidential narratives as well. You, I remember a comment you made, I think at Rappler or another publication, that talked about the thing about Bongbong Marcos is that he has this tangible legacy of infrastructure, right. all these things that he can go back to that really rises above these accusations of you know, inherited corruption right. and, 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 and this predilection towards corruption. Can you talk about that versus Lenny Robredo's narrative? Right. Actually, if you look at the two frontrunners in the vice presidential race, these are also the two candidates that have a very strong narrative. So Bongbong Marcos, for example, builds on the legacy of his father, pointing to very specific achievements. Um, Lenny Robredo, on the other hand, has a very clear narrative of working with the margin the Lai Lion um, as the message. And then we think about Cheese Escudero, who at one point was also the front runner. But if you think about the message and the narrative he puts on the table, that's kind of muted when you compare to these two more formidable candidates, precisely because the message is much clearer. Now, let's talk about, you know, just the idea of presidential power. I mean, Richard Newstead, a presidential historian, talked about presidential power being at least of two things. One is public prestige and the other is the power to persuade. Right. And let's, let's, let's take a case study. Let's say Duterte's lead holds and he becomes president. Right. How do you dial down that narrative? It's very demagogic, very, you know, very straight and narrow, but at the same time, right. two very complex issues that are in the day-to-day -day governance. How do you now translate that into the day-to-day -day business of governance? I think what he has going for him is widespread support, not just widespread support, but committed support by a core constituency. I think that can be a productive democratic force when he wants to institute widespread reforms. For example, federalism. You cannot do federalism without constitutional change. How do you do constitutional change? Through a participatory process. So in that sense, when Duterte moves from his rhetoric to something more tangible in issues of governance, he has to be able to tap 
on the energies that people devoted to his campaign to something more productive, such as a debate on what the federal system would look like, what would a parliamentary system would look like. Well, as we speak, Duterte is casting his vote right now. It's going to be interesting to see also how that translates, if he's successful, into channeling that base of support that is usually outside the system itself. You've got a lot of these Duterte supporters from civic society, the business, a lot of right. unnamed groups as well. But can you talk to me about this power to persuade for Congress itself, because Congress right. will have to convene itself into a constituent assembly, two thirds right. of the vote is needed. Do you think he'll have enough of that political persuasion, so to speak, to get Congress on his side? Well, of course, it's hard to speculate, but my speculation here would be he could be an effective force to galvanize lawmakers from Mindanao. He can be a productive force as well in bringing the issues of Mindanao front and center. Um, this is the ideal because this is what he's, he's building on this. He's building on his political capital to rally support for his pet projects and pet causes. Let's take your PhD hat off and let's put your citizen's hat off. Let's right. talk as citizens. What do you was different from the last presidential election? Was it an improvement? Was it, was it one step mm. back, two steps forward? What does it mean for democracy in terms of the participative aspect of it, right. the technology coming in to make it more accessible, at the same right. time, how the results are actually you know, playing out? Well, I guess it depends where you look. I prefer to look at the productive aspect of this election. For example, it's not insignificant that the presidential debates is one of the top trending topics on Twitter. The top trending topic on Twitter used to be love teams, you know, fans fighting each other. This is not an insignificant achievement. And I think TV5 and Bloomberg did a fantastic job in creating that atmosphere for participation in these debates. Social media can be vile, it can be very disappointing, but again, it depends where you look because this is also a season where you see a lot of posts, people making a case for their candidates. So I think if, if you only look at the, the, the polarized aspect in social media, then you will be disappointed. But if you look at the actual engagements on how people themselves create the narratives of their candidates, how they themselves hold their candidates accountable to their flaws, then I think there's a lot of improvement compared to 2010. Well, it certainly widened the discourse. And thanks for your comment. I hope our bosses are listening. Absolutely. <laughs> but one of the things also about social media and, and, and this idea of channeling this raw you know, emotion and yeah. in, in, in the discourse into, into you know, a, a platform like social media is the idea that there are institutions out there curating uh, mm -hmm. this information or at least trying to synthesize the information in terms of analysis and all that. What do you see in the future, 2019, 2022? Do you see a lot more third-party honest brokers coming to the fore, making sense of this information? Because I can imagine it'll be widened even yeah. more with internet penetration reaching an all-time high in the next few years. Actually, you're absolutely right. A lot of this in is hinged on a better internet penetration with the rest of the population. Let's not forget that a big part of the population still has no access to social media. So in a way, there is still that digital divide. You have people who have voice in social media who can actually frame the debate. I think what's worth watching here would be the fragmentation of information sources in social media where people can triangulate their information. So far, at least as far as the last survey is concerned, most Filipinos still get their information, you'll be happy to hear this, with news and political advertisements. Um, social media is still at the bottom of that, but maybe in 2022 with better access, we can see more people not just getting information from social media, but also acting as content creators. And hopefully by then, uh, we have a citizenry who is more well-versed in navigating the social media. That's why I'm very hopeful, for example, in K-12, because this is an opportunity to teach digital literacy to younger Filipinos. Well, I'm hoping that foundation is also found. I mean, you know, the rate of technology and adoption and absorption is going to be higher. So hopefully in the next three to six years, we'll see that coming into four. Thank you so much, Nicole. Pleasure. Appreciate you having your show. We'll have you again, certainly. Thank you.